From the Dallas On Air studios in beautiful Dallas, Texas, this is Fulfillment right here on DallasOnAir.com. And now here's your host, the Mega Bomber, PJ Dunn. All right, welcome, 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 and Merry Christmas to you. You have now joined the Fulfillment crew, and before we jump into everything today, I got to tell you who the cast of characters are, and then I'll tell you what we're going to talk about today. But joining me today, and still for this year, and the last show of this year, is Horror Mike. How's it going, guys? Good to be back, as always. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Mike, we appreciate it. Uh, and so much, in fact, that we gave him some gifts, and we're going to talk about those gifts here in a second. And also, that voice that you hear from behind the camera that sometimes gets in front of your face, but yet in front of the camera, it is Kazak. Greetings and salutations, <laughs> campers. We're from DallasOnAir.com. Yes, yes. So if you're joining us for the first time, why don't you go ahead and consider subscribing, mm -hmm. commenting for sure. And so what is this show about? This is the show that where we, we talk about movies. We talk about the movies. We talk about the directors, the scripts, the actors, their spouses, the whole thing, what they did when they were five years old and how many times they cheated on a test. We <laughs> know it all and we will talk about it all. So this is episode 23 of season three, the last episode of 2021. And we are going to move forward into a season four. They like us enough for us to do that, so we will be doing that, and that'll start up in January. January, I believe, the 6th or the 9th, but I'll have that corrected for you and, and sent out to you before then. So before we got started today, off camera, which we're going to share with you on camera, is we did a little a little uh, Christmas ourselves today. We did it this morning. So we traded off gifts for each other this morning, and uh, Kazak, what, what did Santa give you? All right, so for me, uh, I... Uh, if you know me, you know I'm absolutely crazy about gremlins. So uh, j just to kind of let you in on one of my family traditions, every year we put a gremlin in the Christmas tree. So this year, <laughs> because there's a gremlin in the Christmas tree, so we've been doing it since like 1984 or whatever. So anyway, uh, uh, this year I got a gremlin from PJ. So this <laughs> is fantastic. Absolutely. It comes with the chainsaw accessory and the skateboard. Uh, this is this is absolutely perfect. I absolutely love it this no question um and of course uh this year one of the great big wonderful surprises uh has been uh uh chucky the child's play series uh, from usa uh and again like don mancini's uh, creation has been exploding off the screen so it's been really beautiful so horror mike gets me a chucky migo i'm so thrilled with this the cloth the the cloth costuming uh, the packaging, it's fantastic. So, yeah, this is so tight. So, yeah, thank you, guys. This is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Merry yeah. Christmas. So, uh, Horror Mike, what did Santa give you? Okay. <laughs> now, if I remember, uh, I am a big, big fan mm -hmm. of horror, just like Kazak. And I, uh, one of my personal favorites uh, uh, is They Live. So, I've got one of the... Alien creatures from They Lived. I absolutely love uh, Funko Pop. Uh, Funko Pops are dangerously addictive. So they like, <laughs> I, I got I got to stop getting Funko Pops. And you got me another one. I'm like, well, now I gotta get John Nada. Like, I, I just gotta. Oh, you completest you. Yeah. You completest. Yeah. And, you, and you need. And also, the other figure they released <laughs> is uh, the uh, Alien in Gray. Oh my gosh! So, so you get the black and white. You already you started it. That was that was a bad move. Yep. Um, so this is great. <laughs> it's Love a good this thing movie. you work at a comic shop, sir. Exactly. <laughs> and my other one, I am a massive, massive fan of, for years since I was a kid uh, of Elvira. So I got uh, these are called the Toonie Terrors Elvira. This is definitely going up right next to my uh, workstation from PJ, and this is uh, one of my favorite. I have uh, the Hostess with the Mostess, and I've always been a big fan. What, uh, I can probably track my love of puns mm -hmm. back to Elvira. I have, These are, yeah. <laughs> I have to figure it's celebrating your 40th anniversary in the business, and she still looks fantastic. It's incredible, right? Yes. I, it's 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 legitimately even when it's it's K Carrie, I think is her real name, Cassandra Peters, Cassandra, Cassandra. Peterson. Cassandra. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, she just looks good. She's just got the the people who just have genetics. It's like wow, she tastes her own. Just looks amazing. That's, that's yeah. Yeah, I I just Beautiful. finished reading her uh, biography, Yours Cruelly, Elvira, and it it's a it it's her story is insane. Yeah, no, wow. she's had a very unique life. Yeah. Thank you guys. This is this is these are great gifts. Yeah. I look forward to putting these on my yeah, desk. Yeah, no, that is perfect. And so Santa also paid me a visit too, and. I have this because Mike works in the comic book and he also knows I love villains. And so I've got this fun book to read about Killmonger because, again, I thought he was a pretty good uh, villain that showed up. And, of course, I love Black Panther. So there's that big connection. And so 
it being a graphic novel, mm -hmm. I will take a look at it and I will read it and this will go on my shelf of books. That's exactly right. And not to be outdone there. You know, when you're having a good time and you're hanging out with folks, you share good things over brews. And so <laughs> this is a shirt from KZAC that I got. I love it. It reminds me of some good beer drinking times that I've had with many people and even with KZAC. So I, 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 but, I appreciate the sentimental but, touch. And like I said, because I know you're such a fan of strange brew, <laughs> Only the true recognize yes. that as yes. an Elsinore Brewery shirt. Yes, thank so you for you, so <laughs> so only for the hosers. Only That's for the right. hosers. So take man. off, eh? <laughs> if you didn't know what this shirt was, take off, you knob. <laughs> 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 yeah. So see, see what Christmas does. It makes everybody happy, and we start calling people knobs again. So with that, <laughs> let's Bring dive into just our first segment. In our first segment. It's called Just Seen It. So if you're new here, this is where we get a chance to talk about what we've seen recently. You'll get a good sense of our taste and what kind of things that we look at and what we're interested in. So you can decide whether we have good movie taste or not by just what we've seen. That's right. So Just Seen It is it. And so uh, we'll start with you, Horror Mike. What have you just seen recently that we need to know about? All right, perfect. Uh, <laughs> for me, was the Matrix, uh, Matrix Resolution... Uh, Resurrections. Oh boy, that was a mouthful. The Matrix Resurrections. This just came out this past weekend. It was an HBO Max day and day release with theaters. And I probably would have seen this in theaters and been very happy with it. I enjoyed This is a sequel to The Matrix. Uh, the last one was Revolutions in 2003. So it's been 17 years. And I will say Revolutions, Resurrections, Revolved, Remixed, re, I'm re, 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 re. I'm seeing a theme re, here. Re, re. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing a theme, boys. <laughs> um, I was pleasantly surprised by this movie. I, I think the one thing that I, I will warn of, mm -hmm. that I don't think the, the, the trailers adequately present, that this is a direct sequel. This is Matrix 4. This is not like a like what you've been seeing recently, like a bunch of reboots. and yeah. Uh, this is like... I would say either watch the previous three movies or watch a I watch a quick 10 minute recap and I'm so happy I did because there were elements of this movie I would have completely missed had I not uh rewatched that recap or not have understood. Really? Uh yeah, it it is it is heavily I think that's the biggest problem I have with the movie is it assumes you watch those three movies and you retain them very well. Mm. Um and for full disclosure, I am a fan of the Matrix trilogy. I'm not a big fan of the third movie. Uh, but I think the first movie is up there as a modern classic. It, you know, it really did change the game. Mm -hmm. uh, storytelling, special effects, a lot of it. And uh, I quite like the second one. This movie, I would say, ranks is probably my second favorite Matrix movie. The first one to me is just on such a high bar as a classic. Okay. okay. But a lot of the uh, Keanu Reeves, Carrie Ann Moss, and a lot of the new actors um, really do a good job uh, with uh, what they are given, and they do very unique takes on the story, and world building is very good in here. I I got nothing but praise for this movie. It really is good, with the exception of it really depends on you knowing the previous three, just mm -hmm. a quick recap, or mm -hmm. um, uh, be willing to go with some of the more unique meta comments of this, of this movie. This movie is very meta, by the way, so it does have something to say about the film industry. Uh, without just blatantly saying it's more of an allegory about film and uh, creation and originality. Um, I do recommend it. And I was telling a coworker that uh, had I seen this in theaters and paid money for it, I would not have been uh, disappointed. I would have I would have been enjoyed it. But I'm also very happy to see it on HBO Max. I think you really mm -hmm. I have a very nice setup in TV, so I, I think I was television worked just fine for me. Also. Is that a humble brag? Nice okay. setup in TV. Tiny's okay. bit. Okay. Tiny's okay. bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wish I could get behind the Matrix franchise. It's just, I I watched yeah. Matrix 1 and I, I've never, I, I, I'm not a fan of Keanu's acting. I love Keanu as a person, but mm -hmm. I've never been a fan of his acting. Mm -hmm. uh, and everything is just kind of like Suit Saves the World. So uh, watching 2 and 3 just keeps on leading me down a rabbit hole just I, I i don't think i can go there again so i, I i'm glad to hear that you liked it yep i just uh, this and that's yeah. a good point Kag. this isn't a movie that isn't about it, it unfortunately isn't about trying to get new fans it's probably i think it's yeah. trying to people who have glommed on and have become fans of the matrix over the min, uh, 17 years mm -hmm. i think it's trying to give them a satisfying 
uh, add-on to the franchise. But I, I think you're right. Matrix is a very weirdly divisive film. I, I, I think very few people dislike the first movie, but it's not for everybody. It's it's a very much like, ooh, this is... Yeah. Mm. And I'll give credit where credit's due. The Wachowskis do uh, world-building like no other filmmaker. Yeah. But it because I mean you really go deep into it because there's so much property out there that surrounds the Matrix that the Wachowskis have been directly hands on in making because you have Animatrix and you have the video game and things like that. There's a whole lot of stuff that you go deep into, uh, which you know if, if if you like world building, that's great, man. Uh, you know credit where credits due. I'll give the Wachowskis all the credit in the world for building what they do. Yeah, this seems like a movie I would. I don't know that I'm interested in, um, not because the Keanu Reeves actually kind of like him to a degree, uh, but I, I'm just, after the second and third one, I was just kind of like, eh, you know? And that, and that so, third one is, is a mess. Like that, yeah. And I'm a person who likes the franchise, and I'm like, that third one was like, oh, geez, <laughs> yeah. So this movie did not have to try hard to, to basically overcome that third movie. But I, I think it's a good, it's well done. I liked it. I think it's got something. I think what yeah. I most like about it is, it's a summer blockbuster. And this is really rare, but it's a summer blockbuster that has something to say. Um, that has like, hey, I've got this is a message we want to tell um, on a grand scale, and I really respect that about this movie. So, mm-hmm. I, if you're a Matrix fan, see it. Yeah. Um, but if you did not care for this franchise, this is not one I would say. Oh, for sure. To see. Oh, for sure. <laughs> if you resisted the others, you probably will resist this one too. If you're not a fan. Yep. What about you, KZAC? What's uh, what have you been watching lately? All right. So for me, uh, I've been checking out a series on Shutter. Uh, where's my? Where's my surprise? <laughs> I did. <Yeah. laughs> uh, this is. Uh, it is a show on Shutter called Behind the Monsters. Uh, what you're getting is it's a short six part series uh, that goes deep into. Uh, some of the creature creations of some of the most beloved horror icons of all time, Freddy, Jason, uh, Michael Myers, uh, Pinhead, uh, uh, Chucky, and uh, uh, one more that's just, uh, that just escapes me. Uh, yeah. But what you're getting is you're kind of getting that uh, behind the music movies that made us uh, treatment where you're getting creators and people like that who are looking at, how these monsters came to be, their impact on culture, things like that. If you're a fanboy, you probably know all this stuff, but it's a good retrospective on just the breadth of how influential these monsters have been. What I'd really, really love to see is them give this treatment to some of the great creators. I'd love to, them to do uh, a deep dive into, you know, guys like Rob Botin or uh, hmm. uh, Clyde Barker or... Uh, uh, you know, Tom Savini, uh, things like that. I'd love to see them give best treat the treatment that they give these monsters to some of the actual creators. Uh, just getting that really kind of in depth, uh, because again, it, it, it's it's fan service, and you know, if you like them, it's a good retrospective. But it, if, if you've seen stuff like Never Sleep Again or, uh, or uh, his name is Jason, things like that, it, it, it's stuff that you already know. But this is a good kind of 4, 30, 45 minute encapsulation of just uh just the impact of some of these really great monsters uh, yeah, yeah. It, I, this sounds great because i'm of the horror uh franchise a uh, subgenre yeah. my favorite type of horror is found footage movies and creature features yeah. love creatures and um is this sounds to me i, I i'm gonna write this down is, is this like uh the films that made us the netflix show yeah. is it similar to yeah. that yeah it, yeah it's very similar like the movies that made us you're getting kind of a full documentary series where they're talking to the creators the writers the guys behind the makeup uh things like that it's kind of a just it's kind of like the vh1 behind the music behind the monsters how these guys came to be on screen and kind of their uh you know some of their troublesome and their really good entries yeah. Well, I have one thing though, Kazak. Yeah. If they don't include fleshy head mutants, <laughs> then I don't know that they covered all the monsters. Well, this is that only they could season have. one. This is okay. only season one, okay. so we we might get something. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> You got me started on this get, strange movie. We didn't, we didn't get the blob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got, was it the movies that made us did the blob? I watched a great show about all the crap that went into making that the, the remake of the blob. Man, what passion and filmmaking. No, that sounds great. That is definitely up my alley. I have not heard of this, but to be fair, it feels like after I had ended my Shutter account, 
that's when they're like, oh, sweet, Mike's Mike's into the shutter account. Time to put all the good stuff on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> time to go back in. Time, time to, go to go back. all in. Uh, time to go back in on this one. Oh, that sounds exciting. I wrote down, yeah. made a note here. I'm right when you thought you were out, you got pulled back in. Get, get me back. <laughs> well, the film that I saw is the film that I know you've seen as well, yes. and I'm not sure if Kazak yeah. has seen yeah, it. I've seen it. Yet. He's seen it as well. Yeah, we saw it. That is Spider-Man, and that is No Way Home. And so... First of all, just say this. Oh, wait, how, before we get into this, how spoilery do you want to get on this? Uh, I'm not going to get too spoilery okay. on it, just anything because. Anything you've seen in the trailer? Yeah, anything yeah. you've seen in the trailer. But I'll, I'll just say it this way, and thanks for that that uh, that caution because I needed that for sure. Um, so this movie, I'll just say this: there's been 49 movies that have made a billion dollars. This is now one of them. This mm -hmm. movie's already at a billion. With what two weeks out? I, already at a billion. I called okay. it. Okay, mm -hmm. and not only that. It's the first movie to hit a bill billion since the pandemic era started. Yeah. The first. Yeah. So that ought to tell you a lot about the story. So once again, the story, we're looking at, at uh, Peter Parker. He still has his good friends, MJ, his girlfriend, and Ned. And the story talks about what do you do when if a villain exposes your secret identity, right? Because there's a reason why you're wearing that mask and you're trying to hide all of that and keep that back because you want to keep people safe. So this movie wonderfully explores what Peter Parker has to do to become that next level of person to grow from just not just a high school kid because now they're talking about going to college and MIT. What does it mean to be a real hero? And that's like, as I go broad, that is the theme that you get. Is the hero just someone who just beats up bad guys because the bad guys deserve it? Or can the hero actually turn the other cheek even and, and give this person a second chance, even though they'd probably rather slit their throat for thinking that way. Yep. So you have that wonderful philosophical piece that's put into it. If you think it's just a dumb lights, action camera, another superhero movie. And I have to say, out of all the Marvel fatigue that I do have, and really superhero fatigue in general, I would say that this movie is probably the best Marvel movie since Infinity War. Yeah. Because it goes back to what movie magic is supposed to be about. And so, and again, you notice I'm talking very, so if people go, he ain't saying enough yet, because I'm trying to be very spoiler less, because anything I say will just bring up some things that we probably already knew anyway, because thank you, internet, that yep, told us a bunch say, of things. We don't want to <laughs> ruin it ourselves, but the internet did not, I waited four days to see it, and I was getting spoiled left and right, like the day of, and day after. Well, we were getting spoiled way before that. Oh, yeah. And about who was exactly. going to be in it and everything else, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John Camper. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it was it's wacky how you, you can't keep a secret anymore and that still didn't hurt this movie i actually think it may have helped it you know honestly like people just want to see if the rumors were true um yeah no i thought it was easy uh i had one caveat that i knew was going to be a billion with one caveat if the movie's good as long as it's not spider-man two levels of bad this movie was going to be a spider-man two or spider-man three. Oh, i'm sorry <laughs> amazing spider-man two okay um, mm -hmm. amazing spider-man two as long as it was not that bad it was gonna coast into the billion dollar club. And like it just had to be a, a decent movie. And not only was it decent, it was actually pretty darn good. Um, like really good. I was well, the speed happy. at which it hit billion. I mean, it's only been out two weeks mm -hmm. and it's already at a billion. That's that's pretty quick. I think and that and I think my theory on that is is simply because there was a uh, uh, I'm not sure the word uh, people were waiting for that movie to go to the theater for. Like they were waiting for that. Like I need that movie that we're gonna go to see. And that there just really hasn't been anything that warned at that level of like let's keep going see and let's make an excitement of it. like an event well know? i think it's the timing of it too because you know kids are going to be out of school and everything else yeah and spider-man's big with kids 100%. so it's a perfect timing for it and it's a movie that parents can take their kids to and not worry about a lot of overt cussing and sexual Bingo. themes put in it so i think it's yeah. the perfect movie for that yeah. yeah um i will say that without getting too spoilery into it the strength yeah. of the film really is finally in its antagonists you have you sure. have actors going yeah. back and exploring the, these characters that they created on screen uh, on kind of a different level, mm -hmm. and giving them depth and, uh, and giving them depth and intrigue and things like that. Which is again for me, the guy who kind of wants that and knows these characters on screen, uh, wanting to see that the way they did it was really fun. Yeah, yeah, it re it, re it really provides some decent payoff throughout the whole thing 100 percent um there's a lot of we discussed this before yeah and you were asking like why are a lot of these mom movies just feel very weak uh and my uh reasoning 
for that was simply because a lot of the movies end and it's just it's an end. It's like a dead weight dropping. It's like that's it. These heroes are just gonna go on a shelf. You won't think about them until you see them in the next Avengers movie. With this film, when it was done, it's like I want to know what happens next to to Peter Parker. Like I want to go on the next adventure. I'm not gonna wait. I want to go read the comics. I want to go read anything I can get. It got me excited about the property that a lot of the movies since Infinity War have not done. Like when Black Widow ends, it's like, oh, that's, I don't know. Okay, she's on the shelf. Until Shoot, when Black Widow began. I yeah, mean, <laughs> or a Shang-Chi, a character who I love, hmm. it's ended. And it's like, oh, okay, he's not, is he not going to go on any adventures while I'm not looking? Like the idea of going on adventures when the movie is done, it seems to be like kind of a lost art for superhero cinema. And Spider-Man really nails that, man. I couldn't tell you when it was done. I was like, what are they going to do next? Like, oh, my God, I, I'm, I'm so excited for what's going forward. Um, kudos to Marvel, man. We we ride them like a donkey, but they really knocked it out of the park on this one. I was very happy with it. Yeah, it makes you beg the question, why can't you do this more often? But 100%. Because of the production yep. schedule and because they put out way in advance, four or five years in advance, here's our assembly line of what's coming out. And so you can just see it. Black Widow suffered from that. Uh, the other one, the other chick, uh, Captain Marvel, she suffered from it. All those movies suffer from, as mm -hmm. soon as you sit down and watch it, you go, okay, here's plot A, here's plot B, here's plot C, here's plot D. And then, oh, the after credit's going to probably touch on this because this is the one character that didn't show up in the runtime of the film. So it's got to be in the, yeah. right? You can pick all this stuff because it's assembly line done. Mm -hmm. But when you watch this movie, it's not that. This movie makes you forget you're watching a Marvel you know, universe film. What you start thinking is, is you start thinking about Peter Parker and the choices he's got to make. And then you think about the choices you made when you were that age and yep. how important it was for you to get to college and for you to do this. And so that movie did what Jurassic Park did, what Indiana Jones did, what, what Star Wars did, the original trilogy. It made you forget junk, sit in there, and then really feel for the character. And what I like is that he didn't speed it up. They didn't try to put quick jokes in it, right, and just dis dissolve the tension. They let them hang in the disappointment, for, you know. So when you have a certain character who dies in the film, they don't hurry up and start cracking jokes and ha ha ha. Yep. Well, maybe next time. Well, maybe she'll show up and she'll be re you know raised from the dead like Palpatine or something. No, when this character dies, the weight is felt from there throughout the whole rest of the movie. And I think you're also touching on, I think, the key element, what makes a good Marvel movie and a bad movie that we've lost in these newer phases. There is a passion and love for the character. Yep. I felt the creative team, everyone from the probably the gaffer to the director, clearly has a love for Spider-Man and its lore and characters. With the other films, they do feel assembly line. I don't think there's a yeah. there's a passion. The Black Widow did not feel like a passion. Promise. Eternals, <laughs> Eternals, yeah. yeah. It didn't feel like a passion. It, those did not feel like films. Like this is someone who Spider Man No Way Home feels like it was made by someone who clearly has loved that character all their lives and wants to show us why they love that character. Yeah, Black Widow feels like somebody who was hired for the job and did a competent job with it but they, there's no passion there. It's like well i was hired to film this movie so i'm gonna i would it. argue that it wasn't necessarily competent with some of the oh the, oh 100 yeah. i'm being i'm being kind <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, you're uh, being way kind i, I, that's <laughs> I think it, it really extremes it i do want to speak to my movie going experience because where yeah, i yes. went i went to alamo draft house and las colinas and alamo really did fantastic. something brilliant by setting up a kind of a 10 minute recap of the entire spider-man cinematic universe that's perfect so you get again like you were saying with matrix you you needed kind of that refresher course yeah. this was a really really good refresher course on the universe of spider-man and the things that were that were and are really important so you get to go back and like i said since i since there was you know some of it that i missed some of it that i forgot uh some of it just needed to be made fun of. <laughs> yeah, um, getting to go back and see that uh, it's real. You can really tell that this is not only someone who loved the Spider-Man uh, comic book and the Spider-Man character. It's also someone who really loves the Spider-Man cinematic universe too, and was really willing to go back in and pull out some of the good stuff that was in there and some of the stuff that wasn't so maybe clearly explained or wasn't so cleanly done to give it kind of that uh, payoff. To give you kind of that feeling to, okay, now I understand why this was blah, blah, blah. And I don't want to stay too long because we got the other movies to discuss. But I will say uh, I listened to a great interview because Sam Raimi's directing the new Doctor Strange movie. Yes. And they asked him about Spider-Man 3. And, he, and this shows those first two because he clearly loves Spider-Man and those early villains. Absolutely. And he believes, he says Spider-Man 3 is a failure because they made him incorporate Venom 
a when character he didn't, he to, didn't yeah. care about. Yeah. And he's like, and he says, I apologize because I, he's like, this is a good character, but I have no attachment to him. It's after his time. I could not give you that. Like he, I think he name drops the new Venom movie. The people on the new Venom movie clearly like Venom more than he does. And it shows there has to be a passion there. Why do you think those first two Spider-Man movies are held in such high regard? Because Sam Raimi put Spider-Man and those villains in such high regard. Um, and uh, we're missing that, especially in a lot of adaptations. Like, uh, the passion for that character. I, I want to feel, why do you think uh, you love this character? I mean, right now it feels like they're so assembly line, like we were saying before. You're just missing that. Yeah, it's yeah. Really and, and that's what happens when it becomes more about corporate and it comes more about dollars yeah. and not about art. And which right? is because funny, when yeah. because when it comes to art, you don't mm -hmm. you don't rush art, and you don't start thinking about the dollar figures before you finish the painting or yep. the drawing or whatever. Your whole idea, the artist falls into the canvas whenever they draw, paint, or write, and that's the process. And it's fun watching what they might do, what extra stroke they might add to it, what if they're writing it, what words they might put to describe what you're seeing in that panel on the screen. So yeah, that's why to me. Uh, what I this is the this, this is the uh, draw you off side statement is that this is why I hate movies mostly today even though I do a movie show because as soon as I sniff this cash grabs and all this stuff mm -hmm. I know that the art isn't pure mm -hmm. I know that it's just some version of some guy who never drew in his life never did anything with a camera in his hand that's because he's got a suit on and he's got a degree he's saying uh, no we've got to add this in here because we've got to have at least 15 of these in this movie because that's what our statistics tell us that we need to have in order to have a movie that will pop whenever they try to take it and make it an ai type thing I, i'm i'm gonna be out because i'm like no man i want to see the art because yeah. art is freedom man Nobody can box you in because whatever you draw, whatever you write, whatever you paint, whatever you sing, it comes from you. And it's coming from a real place yeah. that someone who's a corporate shill looking over the top can never get. Yep. And that's, that's the part about that. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, that is pretty interesting. And you have seen now what we have seen. So good, good group of movies. If you liked any of those, go see them. Watch them when they start to stream. But either way, I think the ones that we picked here today and that we're telling you about, they're definitely worth seeing. So... Yes. I know what you want now. You want to hear about our main topic. And the main topic today yeah. is the best film slash series of 2021. Because this is the end of the year. This is the last week coming up. And also, we're going to pick at least one worst film. Because it's always fun to rag on something that's horrible and that deserves to be ragged on. So we'll start with the, the best. And again, it's not just films. We're also talking about TV series and streamed. Uh, things as well, and maybe even uh, books and media that may have come out, because sadly, there just weren't that many great films in 2021. Yeah. Uh, we're going to start with you, Horror Mike. Just give us one, and we're going to go around the room, popcorn style. Perfect. So just give I'll us start one with of yours. my number three on the list. Uh, Dune Part One. Uh, okay. This is a adaptation of the book series. My dad's a huge fan of this series. Me, I've never got into it. My only familiarity yeah. with the series was the 84 film. Yeah. Um, and I respect it, but I was definitely like, ooh, this is not, that case out with The Matrix, I was like, mm, this is not for me. Yeah. After seeing this film, it's like, all right, I get it. I get it. This thing is, I argue, cinematically, storytelling-wise, this is one of those game-changer films. Uh, one of my favorite aspects of it is the main actor, uh, let me pull up his name here, Timothy Chalamet. And uh, I got early Luke Skywalker vibes from this kid. Like, this kid felt like this is a natural hero heroic charisma. The director uh, really sells the grandiose of this world, the vision. Uh, this is a movie that I kind of low-key, not low-key, very publicly say, like, if you don't care for this movie, man, I don't think you like, I think you may not like cinema. Like, this is why we go to movies, is movies like this. I saw it on HBO Max and I went and found a IMAX showing to see it again. Uh, the only criticism I have of the movie is that this movie is part one, and they just it basically just kind of hard cuts. It's like, all right, we're we're getting ready to go on this new adventure to be continued. Uh, yeah, I've got none but praise for this movie. It's really well done. Yes, fair warning. It's a bit it's very long, but it is very good. So this was my number three on my uh, list for top of uh, Dune Part One. Yeah, Dune Part One must see. I think it's a really good film, especially for our audience. It's okay. Really good. Okay. How about you, Kazak? 
All right. Uh, so for me, since we've already kind of started out, since we've kind of started down <laughs> this road, uh, I got to go. I got to go with uh, the Disney Plus series that came out in 2021. Okay. I have really, 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 really enjoyed the storytelling that they've come through on everything that they've knocked out of the park on this one. WandaVision, Loki, Falcon and Winter Soldier, mm. What If, Hawkeye, all of it has been really good, compelling storytelling. Disney put their money where it needed to be, got creators behind it, got really well, well-known well talent to put their heart and soul into a television series yeah. that could have easily been written off, and it's not. It's really good storytelling. The effects have been compelling. The the shows have been the shows have been drawn in. WandaVision was heartbreaking. Falcon Winter Soldier really kind of gave a face to some really, you know, tough issues. Loki mm-hmm. was uh, you know, just beautifully written in the way in the way they had Tom Hiddleston kind of portraying kind of the heartbreak and uh in being who he is. What if was a really well done animated show. Uh and Hawkeye's just been fun. It's yeah. just been it's just been a fun way to go. They've really done well with um, taking a limited series, six parts, and saying, "Give us good story. Give us a decent two hour film. Give nice. us a decent two hour film. Give us, give us good Marvel storytelling." And yeah. that's what they've done. They've given us good Marvel storytelling. I want. I I'm interest. I'm interested in the depth that they were able to go into with a lot of the characters who were kind of maybe a little B and C list in the movies. But now giving them this platform, giving them that exploration, giving them that space to work and create and make really good storytelling, I, I'm, I'm all in. The Disney gets to, gets to keep getting my money for another year because of this really good storytelling. The um, I watched all the shows, and I agree with everything 100%. Mild pushback on what if, only because it was the nature of the show makes it wildly uneven for me. It was overall a fun ride, but I yeah. like you. Hawkeye was I was pleasantly surprised and I do not care about Hawkeye. I, I <laughs> exactly. Just, I do not care about that character. B list and, and C list stuff. Exactly. And but they, give it but give it, you know, half an hour, se- seven hour, six parts. That's exactly what you need. That's the time frame you need to get it should, done. Disney Plus is Disney is such a weird anomaly that there is a level of quality they put into their shows that I do not see into their films. Uh, outside their animation. Their animation is always top tier. But yeah. their live action films do not have the quality I see in their shows. And that is so weird to me that you would put so much money into uh, a smaller package than you would into your bigger package. Like, it's very strange. But I, I agree. Yeah, it's well, you know, it's, and that's and that goes back to, I guess, what I was saying earlier. When the suits get involved, when it's a two-and-a-half-hour movie, the argument becomes what belongs in the two-and-a-half hours. Yeah. Whereas when it's a series that's got six parts to breathe in between the next episode and the next one, you have time to think through and do more stuff. So it's better. It's why the books are always better than the movie. Yeah. Because the book is like as many pages as it needs to be, but the movie's constrained to a two-hour t- you know, frame. And so now it becomes, well, what belongs in that two hours? And then because these guys are looking for just the hit, they're headhunters for just hits yep. rather than good movies, then they go, well, since it worked over here in Captain America 1, now that we're doing Captain America 158, we got to do it again because that's what they seem to like, and they so they they do this monotonous sameness when they don't realize that the reason why these guys wrote these characters in the first place was because Falcon was supposed to be different than the Winter Soldier, and Black Panther is supposed to be different than Luke Cage, and Luke Cage is supposed to be different than Iron Fist because they're all coming from some place that's unique that's different. So just let the story breathe, and I think from what I'm hearing from you guys, that's what they let happen. They let the story yeah. breathe in yeah. these series. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the actors too. The actors get a, lo- get a lot of room and a lot of leeway to kind of make these characters shine. I mean, who gave a damn about Agatha Harkness of all characters? Uh, uh, kind of a, mm-hmm. you know, one shot. Kind of a one shot in the uh, Scarlet Witch universe, and yet you have Catherine Hodge, who really brought her to life, made her enjoyable, and now she's getting her own damn series. Good for her. You're yeah. missing out. One of my favorite actresses, who I didn't even realize was in the Hawkeye. What's her name from The Conjuring? Um, the uh, Vera Farmiga. Vera Farmiga, Farmiga is mm-hmm. in Hawkeye. Mm-hmm. Great. Like I said, the Marvel Disney manages to get top top tier talent, and yeah. uh, I almost feel like the Marvel license kind of holds some of these great actors back because Vermeer, i was like i could almost feel her like come on let me give me my give me my bit i want to want to show you how great i am uh it's good stuff so i i, I can't wait for you to one day set aside and time to, to 
there's television right now for storytelling is where it's at. Like television is killing it because everyone's it's competition, the streaming wars. Everyone's trying to get you to come over to their streaming, so they got it. They know they have to have good content. And uh, man, you you could lose all your time just watching how many good shows there are. For sure, I think part of it is the agent will go back to these great actors and say, "Listen, it's a Disney product. You can't not do a Disney product. Yep. That's going to give you more eyes, viewers for other movies." Yep. So in a way, they almost have to do these Disney movies and, and Marvel movies because this next generation coming up doesn't know who who uh, Mill Streep is. Yeah. But they'll tell you that they know who any one of these Marvel characters are. Yeah. Just any one of them. They'll and Meryl Streep was in Guardians, right? So it's like, yeah. So, yeah. so it's like, yeah. They, yeah. They, but they won't yeah. know what her filmography was before that. They'll 100%. just go, Meryl Streep, the one from uh, Guardians of the Galaxy? No. She has done way more than that. So I think that's a very interesting uh, thought process in that. And that's what uh, Kazak had suggested for me as well as you to watch on my next downtime when I have some time to binge. So I want to dive in, just get a, a sliver of each and every one of them just to get a sense. Yep. Uh, because I, I think that would be a good payoff. My number three. So I would say this. So my number three film in 2021 is going to probably be one of the, one. it's probably the second film that I saw in 2021, and it is A Quiet Place 2. Yeah. So here's why this is great. Once again, you bring back the same cast of characters in this, except for the ones that, spoiler alert, had died in the first one, right? So John Krasinski and his wife Emily Blunt reprise the roles this is what you call a movie that understands what its first one did and then didn't try to trick it up and make it five times worse than what it was in the first one in terms of all the attacks and all that stuff. It's a very competent sequel. It moves the story even further from the last one because it takes over the next day, which was great because the first one deals with the isolation of just being a family. But then what about the isolation of being part of a town that's hiding and there's other people out there? So I love that it didn't just didn't go, let's just keep this small. And isolated within the family because we already seen all that. So John Krasinski's smart and how he decided to write this. And so what I think is going to happen here, Mike uh, and Kazak, is that by the time they do the third one, this is going to be one of the top trilogies ever made. Once it's once they get to the third really? one, what they've shown me with how they care about the first two, I'm pretty sure this third one that they're working on right now yep. is also going to be excellent. I agree. I agree 100. percent I said I, as weird as it sounds, I said quiet. I agree with him. Monday. I said quiet place. Uh, Captain America. And as weird as trust me, that's a good movie. It, Paddington Bear are gonna be like the top three like modern trilogies. Like they're just movies that just kept getting better with like each entry. Um, yeah, I, I, Quiet Place Two is a very good film. I do kick myself I wasn't able to see it in theaters. I wish I could have. It was so crazy when that when that movie hit. But boy, in a normal theatrical environment, that movie would have come close to cracking a billion. It was a very very good movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is definitely a franchise that I haven't gotten to watch. I got, I get into it. I haven't gotten to watch it, and I, I really dig the concept. I really dig horror, and you know, John Krasinski's a and Emily Blunt are a really fine couple. I, I'm curious to see this this franchise. It's because of this this movie why I said they're my number one picks for when if when they ne when they get to Fantastic Four, they should be Mister Mrs. Fantastic. Like they are. They have such chemistry, and I even said he should direct it. Like he, that's how good these movies are. I'm like, yeah, he needs to direct that movie. Yeah, he's a stud. He's he's, he's a Spielberg in the making for sure. 100%. And I think people might say that might be a little early to say that, but for the, what he's already done competently already. Yep, it's it's pretty amazing. So yeah. how about another one, uh, Kzek? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mike. I'm gonna Mike and then go I, back here. My <laughs> number two was J James Gunn, The Suicide Squad. Uh, this movie not to be confused with, with suicide, suicide squad, squad make sure you put the, the or the, the v depending on which part of the country you're from yeah. right? exactly right <laughs> l suicide squad um not to be confused with 2016 i believe it's 2016 will smith uh which is fun it's a it's i put in the category of fun bad movie it's, yeah. it's not a good movie no <laughs> see i not like fun. it but it ain't good uh, this is no. guilt by actor association <laughs> it's will smith that's I the do reason love me some will smith <laughs> uh, that said this movie is outstanding and this is a almost uh you i almost feel like you could teach us in course of how to do a ensemble cast very well with modern uh, filming because there's better movies like Ocean's the original Ocean's Eleven does a bigger ensemble class I would argue better okay. but of modern movies it is I so rarely see big casts given screen time character development mm -hmm. and also a great structured story and James Gunn has proven to be a master of this now twice with uh, 
Guardians and that Guardians of the Galaxy Volume One, and now with uh, this movie, The Suicide Squad. Because with the exception of Harley Quinn, uh, these are all F list characters. Now, I'm a big, big, big comic book nerd for DC Comics, and and I, two of these guys, I was like, I don't know who that is. Uh, this is a well done movie. I, I the only criticism I had for it is. It's needlessly gory because that is his style. Uh, there are scenes where I was like, you could have just uh, gotten that accomplished by just a quick cut or something like that, but he lingers on things. That's He loves this over-stylization of violence. But it's a must-see, man. I think if you even if you hated the original, this redeems it across the board. Like, it's a good movie. And just proves yet again why James Gunn is so beloved by Hollywood because he does have the skill to take characters that are just been on the shelves for years and make them A-list. Or it makes make you feel like these are A-list characters by building stories with the characters, building up the characters and relationships and make you care. And uh, we were talking about passion for filmmaking. James Gunn clearly loves these characters and clearly wants us to like these characters along with them. Yeah. Th um, this movie was number four on my list and I think I disagree with you on the non-necessary violence and gore. No, this one needed to be an adult comic book film. This yeah. one needed to be needlessly violent. This one needed to be absolutely insane because the first one played it so safe it played like an hour and a half movie trailer. With this one, you got genuine <laughs> pathos. You yeah. got violence you got you needed to care and good god some of the some of the violence is absolutely hysterical it is so over the top it's insane <laughs> uh, uh you you have john cena who was absolutely fantastic who would have given the i've never given a damn about john cena and i definitely want to see peacemaker yep. i'm can't wait for that Sick. series I'm on, on for... hbo yep. um K king shark was hysterical the the steve ag performance voiced by Sil sylvester stallone you don't see that coming and it's perfect every bit of this movie was just fun this was this was a number four on my list and i absolutely dug everything about this film uh, it, it is a dirty it is a dirty dozen remake with mm -hmm. some really really compelling fun storytelling in it james gunn knocks that out of the park and i i didn't think the, the violence was unnecessary i think it absolutely had to happen that way because it was so entertaining and i mm -hmm. should clarify because you are right he handles violence but i want more people to see this movie yeah and it, it that is going to be very off putting because i love the character of king shark and i think they <laughs> linger on a lot of his kills so to speak that I know a lot of people would be like, ooh, I like this and cut it off. I'm like, man, yeah, I think you, uh, it's a good movie. I really yeah. enjoyed it. I, yeah. I do recommend it. Yeah, but yeah, you, 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 you do have to kind of push through that James Gunn. There's going to be some violence here. There's going to be some stuff that if you're squeamish about gore, it's going to make you uncomfortable. But yep. it is a really good movie. And I just think the violence is so over the top and fun. It had to be in there. But that, but that's just me because I am a James Gunn trauma head. So same, yeah, 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 and I love I've loved almost all of his movies. Uh, I think the weakest movie I didn't care for his was Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two. Yeah, and like we said before, it feel that movie feels corporate as compared to the first movie. It feels more natural. So yeah, yeah. That, that's my number two is uh, the or L Suicide Squad <laughs> or La Suicide Squad. La Suicide Squad. Fringe. Yeah, how about you, K Zach? What's another one that you said was great in 2021? All right, so for me, it wasn't so much a it wasn't a movie it was a book but interesting it, but Indeed, i okay. but i had to go with it because of the way it was done it was the novelization of once upon a time in hollywood yeah. by quentin tarantino quentin right. tarantino uh taking on the taking on the book version of uh his story getting to see the creative process that was going into it. He doesn't linger on the, the things that were already played off so well on screen. He was really going more into depth into the character. He was hmm. really going more into uh, deep in the storylines, going more into uh, the emotions and things like that. It's a really wonderful continuation of uh, the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood story. Uh, it's done, uh, you know, wonderfully like an old school paperback, even up to... Uh, the advertisements in the back for other books. Uh, the way that they did it is really kind of an embrace of how they used to do novelizations back in the 70s and 80s of these uh, uh, movies. And again, getting to see the creative process, getting to see the character building world. Because again, like mm -hmm. like we were talking about uh, uh, earlier uh, with the with casting and world building, Quentin Tarantino also is very, very big in world building and character building and things like that. So you're getting to see that for the first time in kind of novelization form with this. And it's really uh, 
intriguing in the way that they kind of go into it, uh, getting them to develop, uh, you know, some of the Manson characters, getting the, to develop uh, uh, Rick Dalton's uh, vision, getting to see, you know, exactly what happened uh, with Cliff Booth uh, and, you know, how he came to be where he is as a stuntman. Uh, getting more of that in-depth character was really compelling, and it was a really, really fun read. I actually need to get the hardcover edition of it just so I can get more because there's a whole lot more that goes into that, too. It's more than I want because, again, I love Tarantino characters. I love Tarantino storytelling, and this was something that was really, for me, as a Tarantino fan, a really kind of juicy bonus look at this world that was created in the film. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Check, I'll check it out. I, I don't have as much time to read as much as I used to. Uh, just nature of working at a bookstore, right? Uh, but I'll check it out. I really did enjoy the movie uh, Once Upon a Time in Mexico. I tend to like almost everything. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I, I said Hollywood. Mexico. I apologize. <laughs> Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I tend to like. <laughs> That's it. Robert Rodriguez, sir. <laughs> right? Exactly. Big difference. Uh, I tend to like almost everything. He's just one of those directors that, uh, like we were saying a few weeks ago, W.S. Anderson. Uh, I don't think I've seen a movie where I put it down like this is bad. Like it's usually like okay, like, this is pretty good. Like usually yeah. he's just one of those names I can trust. So I'll have to look into it. I'll, I'll check it out. Yeah, and it, 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 get get into if you want to get a good novel and you want to get it more in story, this is one to reach out for. Yeah. See there, see there, see what you can get, fans. It's not just movies, but we're reading books over here too. So there's that. Uh, so my my second one then. Okay, so I'm, you know, you're coming off of Quiet Place 2 is my number three, so my number two is Spider-Man No Way Home. So this could be that I'm guilty of just recently seeing this and it's still being so fresh on my mind that it makes it this high up in the list, but I have to say, if I didn't say it in the first segment, that no, this is why we go to the movies. This movie embodies movie magic, right? So when you go see this movie, Spider-Man, no way home. You're going to feel the same way you did when you saw Jurassic Park, when you saw Indiana Jones, and, and any of the other great films like E.T. and even the original trilogy, because this movie, once again, this is what's missing in most of, of, of Hollywood's films now, and that is that there's a central character that we actually give a damn about, and you do here. You really do. Um, now, in the age of over making everybody funny all the time, they were able to resist the urge in the moments when it was tense. Yeah. Again, I this is probably why I give this even more credit and then than more because I like the fact that they paid attention to tone. In most movies, tone is missed or it's recharacterized as in everybody has to be funny, everybody has to be quipping, even when there's bad stuff happening and right there in front of them and they're in imminent danger, which then takes that away. You don't get that sense here at all. When, like I said earlier, when a particular character dies, that whole movie sits right there and says, feel this. Yeah. Feel Peter Parker's pain, feel everybody's pain that had to watch this, see this, or acknowledge this, that this event happened in the movie. And then you watch how, after that, the dominoes start falling over and all the other parts that matriculate about why it's important to care about people and who you are and why you're here and what's your identity. And, and when you leave, what are you going to leave? What's your legacy, right? And so you get that sense of that here. And, uh, you know, so this movie, I have to put this here because out of 2021, this is a movie I would sit down and watch again in the theater. I'd do it tomorrow for sure. I'd go watch Quiet Place 2 again, and I'd do the same thing for my first movie, which I'll say that for when it's time for me to reveal that. Yep, for sure. You were going to say, um, Mike? No, I, I, the only thing I was going to add, yeah, it almost feels like you you, you, you were saying, you don't know why you had put that high, maybe because of the excitement. And also, it's just because everything around it just wasn't as good. It's like, I remember a time, even like, 10, 15 years ago, like, this Spider-Man movie would have been, like, the average movie for the year. It's like, oh, yeah, that was a pretty good movie, but there were other movies. And now, like, wow, you just don't see this as much anymore. And it's like, it's kind of tragic. This should be the base level for for cinema. And I'm just not, you're just not getting this. Like, it, it's, uh, I agree 100%. Like, it's, it's really kind of sad that you don't get this more often. Yeah, and I'll say this last piece, I definitely want to hear Kazak on this, too. And this is how you do nostalgia right. Yes. Right? Without giving anything else away. This is how you do nostalgia right. So yes. Star Wars sequel films, this is what you should have done yeah. with the characters. Instead of bringing back Palpatine, mm -hmm. if you were going to do that mess, you need to do it like the way this film was looking at that whole idea. I love Ghostbusters Afterlife, but the nostalgia was a little bit janky. It did seem a little on the nose. Yeah. This one felt natural. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I bring it up. That like I was like, Ghostbusters Afterlife does a pretty good job with using nostalgia to tell a story. For sure. But this one is better. Even better, it yep. feels more natural to the story. Yeah. Um, same, that's another movie where I just feel the passion of the 
people loving the franchise. And Ghostbusters Afterlife is not a bad movie at all, but this is all the things that I think Ghostbusters Afterlife did pretty good. This knocks it out of the park. All is like, if they make another Ghostbusters movie, they should really look at how this movie was made to try and take notes from it. So yeah, full agreement. No, that's solid. So, how about you uh, or Michael? Well, right. I, well like I said, oh, I, I'm, 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 sorry, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm gonna definitely agree with you in the fact that it's not just the one that we just saw; it was one of the better ones that we saw in a theater. Yeah, this yes. was a fun theater going experience. That's a great point. Uh, you know, everything visually played out very nicely. The 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 characters have impact. The the way it was filmed was really done well for a theater. This was really worth going to a movie on. This wasn't this wasn't one that you needed to wait to go see it on streaming. This wasn't the one that you waited to go see on Redbox. This is one that really did on screen cinema well this year this year. Yeah. Uh, and like and my God, I'll I'll agree with you too. And the fact that it was kind of like the baseline for what normal uh, movie going would be. But this one was really just enjoying compelling story time on screen with really good visualization uh they really kind of carried over uh just so much fun of the of some of the earlier stuff mm -hmm. but also uh, continuing the marvel franchise and continuing just pulling in it's a way to pull in what's good about all of this stuff it's a good way to kind of pull us into what's good about going to a movie yep. yeah which we have been missing all year which we have absolutely been bereft of and we haven't and since you know we we've been kind we've kind of hit that point and we're gonna have to i think yeah. crawl back into our shells again which really kind of sucks i'm gonna say that <laughs> but at least we kind of got one more good movie going experience in before we got to go back and uh, yes this was a really for for us as as fanboys for us as comic book fans for us who really really dig this kind of filmmaking yeah. this was a really good payoff uh you know it, it was it a you know remarkable masterpiece of uh no but it was a really fun movie and that's what we needed yep. yes yeah it connected so universally all right, Mike, okay. we're putting the pressure on you. Oh, my goodness. Uh, all the movies of 2021, which one would you say was the top or series? Oh, like we said, is series yep. number one. Mm -hmm. I can say without a doubt, no hesitation in my voice, Arcane on Netflix. The okay. animated series on Netflix. Based okay. on the video game League of Legends. Don't need to know anything about that game, trust me. Um, this is a story of two sisters in a very kind of steampunk fantasy world. Mm -hmm. Kind of separated by class and... Um, crime and it's got an amazing villain it's got amazing story to tell this thing borders on being perfect and it is a nine episode series and this thing has great animation it's an animated series uh, very mature the problem with American mature animation is a lot of it is just family guy just dumb mm. fart jokes and yeah. this is no this is a mature story about PTSD uh, trauma um how society can uh affect families and uh a world building that's master class mm -hmm. uh one thing that i kind of low-key accept but annoys me in a lot of films is there's a lot of kind of fluff in movies there's a lot of fat in movies where they just add in they take up too much time for a joke or yeah this show reminds me of how only two shows honestly in the last four three or four years um are just lean shows where I don't feel there's anything cut, and that's Yellowstone mm -hmm. yep. and this show. These shows are lean to the point where when I'm watching other shows, mm -hmm. I'm like, eh, you could have cut that out. You didn't really need that. I loved Hawkeye, but there's basically an entire plot thread I really didn't need. Like, I, I again, and that's when you watch really well made shows mm -hmm. like Yellowstone and Arcane, you realize this is, th this is as close to a perfect like show you can get. I cannot recommend Arcane heavily enough. Like, the there's absolutely no one I wouldn't recommend this TV show to. The only people I wouldn't recommend it to is if you genuinely hate steampunk. I mean, you have got to really hate the steampunk kind of aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. This is great storytelling, great acting. Mm -hmm. Haley Steinfeld plays one of the main characters, and um, she was in the Hawkeye show. Great actress who's going to be on the rise. Um, it's nine parts. Only thing I have prepped you for is this is a season one. Has the mother of all cliffhangers, but my goodness, is this my number one show uh, for this year? I don't. There's not even anything that even comes close. Like like wow. not even by a country mile. 
Wow. Uh, this is great, great, uh, great television show. And again, don't worry if you don't know about the game. They they knew that going in, so they world build accordingly. So that I know PJ has never probably even heard of the game. No, I you you are its actual target audience because they they're genius because they mm. realize oh the people who know the game they're gonna be mm. there anyway. Mm. We need to make fans of the people who absolutely have no idea who we are and build the character in the world and make them care about it as much as people who've been playing this game for over a decade. Mm -hmm. um, two thumbs up. Yeah, I don't think there's anything even close for me. Uh, wow. Okay. That, 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 and, had I, and had I seen Yellowstone, I feel like the nature of Yellowstone, just how consistently good it always is, mm -hmm. may have been the only close, close to it. Um, I did not get a chance to see Yellowstone this season, yeah. but... Uh, Arcane television wise, knocked it out of the park. Could yeah. be happy with that show. Yeah, I'm working on that. I'm thinking about uh, maybe getting a couple of, uh, you know, I've got season one and season two. I'm thinking about buying season three and maybe doing a Yellowstone night. So I would definitely yeah. invite you to it. It'd be a, just a good night that everybody kind of has free. And uh, yeah, I want to do something to that because I think, I think this is one of those shows that you would do that with. Uh, just like people used to get together for TV shows back in the day, yeah. um, because it was just fun to, and to take it all in together, like you were at the movie theaters. I think this that that would be that case. So I'm working on that. I'm trying to see what I might do about that. Oh, that's gonna be fun. So that'll be fun, and everybody will be invited. So, uh, Kazak, we're putting the pressure on you now. <laughs> Here it is, the number one thing that titillated you, uh, excited right. you. So. So we you. went. So I went in for a TV series. So I went in for a book. So I actually had to pick a movie because we're on a movie show. Yeah. Uh, so one that we haven't gotten to discuss, that we that might kind of touched on, but we I kind of wanted to get into because yep. I enjoyed the experience, and that was Ghostbusters Afterlife. Tell your yes. story. I loved what Jason Reitman did with the franchise. I loved mm. what they did with this going back enough to make me remind me of why I dug Ghostbusters in the first place. Takes me back to 1984 and takes me back to, you know, going to enjoy something visually fun on screen, going to enjoy really funny people putting in good dialogue. Paul Rudd is fantastic. The kids in this movie are really super, are really superb in, in these roles. Uh, again, visually it was fun, but more importantly, it, it was good Reitman storytelling. Uh, I, J Jason is a very, very good filmmaker, like his dad, uh, and this was a fun movie-going experience. This was one that I was excited to go see in a film because, again, this is one that I've been waiting on for, you know, a, a, a couple years. And, you know, just seeing those, those little trailers and teasers and things like that and finally getting this film, and the film delivers. The film delivers all the way down, and the fact that it does touch on nostalgia, but we do get a new story. We get some real com kind of compelling moments. Uh, we get some, you know, very nice surprise cameos. We get enough fan service to where it doesn't feel like it grates or hammers it down your throat. Hmm. And again, there's a lot of it that's just fun. It's a. F it was a fun night to go to a theater. It was a fun night to go sit, chomp popcorn, and watch something that I really dug when I was younger that I still dig now and getting, you know, a, an enjoyable film. Uh, it, it does find, it does wonderfully toe that line, you know, between eerie and weird and uh, comedy and things like that. It was a really kind of fun uh, family film that, you know, where, where, where you can't recommend Suicide Squad to everyone, you can do that 100%. with Ghostbusters. You can give this mm -hmm. to anyone and say, go enjoy a fun night in the theaters with kids. Give the give them this film because it's really fun, uh, and and that's what I like when I go to the movies is that to get me to a theater, it's got to be fun or it's got to be unique. This one was a fun film, yeah, for me. And I think yeah. that's the theme of uh, a lot of these uh, our top lists. What are the theme of the day is passion for the for the property or project, and they don't feel corporate. Cor Ghostbusters could have very easily have been corporate. Um, that movie feels like a, a love letter to people who love that franchise story. I, I, I'm a massive Ghostbusters fan. Yeah. Uh, it's one of my favorite properties. Aliens, Back to the Future, and Ghostbusters are like my, my three favorite properties. And man, was I satisfied. I, I, I was like, this yeah. is a very good conclusion. No, I think that's a great uh, number one. Yeah. Well, then that puts it on me now. So I'm going to go a completely different direction. Than everybody, than everything well, no. we've done today. So, oh, because I am a big fan of civil rights history in this country. So, you know, my number one film is, uh, film is going to be Judas uh, and the Black Messiah. Mm -hmm. So, again, again, a movie many people are not going to go see. 
but don't know the history at all of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party that Fred Hampton was the chairman of who was killed by Chicago PD, and they shot him up worse than they did Breonna Taylor in her room, right? Yeah. And it's, am it's amazing some of the parallels that you see to some of this stuff and how that was way back. You're talking about in the 60s and this in 70s and this stuff going on to where we can show you ideas of this kind of happening today. But here you get Daniel Kaluuya, so everybody knows him by now with Get Out and being Black Panther's best friend and Black Panther. Uh, and now here he is playing the chairman himself, Fred Hampton. Now this is interesting because Fred Hampton is this Chicagoan Right, and Daniel Kluge is a British actor. So for him to go get the, the you, know, you know, and I talk about this a lot, Mike, is whenever I see someone who's not from the United States nail a very nuanced uh, vo voice, like somebody who would, who would have a, an accent, if you will, yeah. being from Chicago, but also being black and having that soulfulness, the, the kind of tone in his voice to ring out whenever he gives speeches. Because whenever you do people like Martin Luther King Jr., Fred Hampton, you gotta be able to have, almost have that preacher sound who can, who can carry that note because that, there's something about that, but he pulls that off, no problem. The other standout here is Lakeith Stanfield who plays William O'Neill, who is the guy who betrayed Fred Hampton and told the police everything that they needed to know uh, about it. Now he was perfect in this as a foil and also as a pitiful person. He played the most pitiful role you could think of as a, as a black man selling out other black men. Mm -hmm. Like what that means and what that must feel like and how he feels it later. It's the perfect title, Judas, because that's what Judas did when he betrayed Jesus. As the account goes, you know, he wanted to trade in the 30 pieces of silver for what he did because he realized what he had done. Same thing actually happens in real life here with, with William O'Neill way after the fact when he realizes there ain't a black person that's going to stand behind you. In anything you do with what you Best did, what you did yep. to him, right? And then you have Jesse uh, Plemons here, who was born in Dallas, Texas. So y'all remember him from being in Breaking Bad and the the spinoff movie El Camino that had Jesse and him in it, right? And so he's he plays the the informant. Uh, he's the guy that the that Bill O'Neill goes to as the informant. He goes to him, and he's the guy on the police side of things that tells him we need to know, we need to know where they're going to be, where they're going to be, because they're trying to get the information so they can go and plot to kill him. So they're thinking, okay, you got to tell us, where's he at? How's he armed? How many men? Right. So he does a great job playing just this, this soulless person that's just like, it's just a job and I get paid very well. I have no, no problems with Fred Hampton personally, but it is my job and I have to do this as somebody who's ahead of, in my department where I'm at. I, I couldn't agree more. Like I watched, that's probably of 2021. Mm -hmm. I watched that movie the most. This is one of the things yep. I will miss about the HBO Max experiment. They are going to end it, but the experiment of doing day and date release. It mm -hmm. gave me the opportunity to watch that movie multiple times yeah. uh, at my leisure to pause, take things in. Uh, yeah, no, that was a great film. It came out so early. It was February, right? Yep. Man, it this year went so fast. I kind of forgot it was within this year. Um, Black History Month. Yeah, no, that's, I, I remember that it came out within the month. So, yeah, it was 100%. Yeah. I, I couldn't – I there's not a single thing you have said that I disagree with. Like, it yeah. is a master class movie. Mm -hmm. Um the way it's presented, um, even as, as someone to me who is aware of the history of that, yeah. they clearly did more research. And Daniel Kaluuya? Kaluuya. Kaluuya. Man, I can't even pronounce his name. Mm. He, the, the other great thing about the HBO Max, you got to see the interviews right after. And yep. you got to see how much research he did. He got mm -hmm. to see the family, his son, mm -hmm. uh, learn about like how would he have talked, how would he have moved, how mm -hmm. would he have acted. Mm -hmm. Again, the passion of, for the actual historical figure is really there. And Steinfeld, I watched him again this year in um, uh, 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 The Harder They Fall. Uh, and that's another movie. It's like, man, this is a, this guy's gonna... We're seeing in real time, man. These, these are two actors I think are gonna be Denzel-level talent in, in the next few decades. Like, they're gonna be outstanding. Like, we're seeing a lot of great actors really carrying these stories. Yeah, it was um, directed by Shaka King, and then Ryan Coogler produced it. So that's great. And then Shaka King also wrote the screenplay, which is pretty incredible within itself yeah um no it, this is a it is a dark story and i think that's probably why it kind of got it didn't get memory hole for sure it's about to get a lot of awards but i'm just saying that it, yeah <laughs> there are so many upbeat movies that a lot of people like myself just kind of forget oh crap that that was a great movie and it came out i just kind of naturally forgot about it. thank you for reminding us all how good that movie is that is a that was an incredible movie. i love that movie yeah. well yeah i think what it does is it covers a lot of history that people don't know they really don't know, or if they know it, they know very shallow pieces to it. They don't know the full underpinnings of what was going on. That, you know, you had Martin Sheen also playing Edgar Hoover, you know, and how Edgar Hoover was tapping people and doing all this stuff. So, like, people getting frustrated with Facebook following all your stuff. Well, 
this is what J. Edgar Hoover was doing all the time, especially if you were a black person speaking up in, in the 60s and 70s about stuff that if a white person spoke up about it, it'd just be considered, oh, yeah, he's just speaking his piece. It's, you know, but here, these guys do it, and they get shot down and killed and murdered by the police. But first, they get their character defamed as in these are hardened bad criminals that are trying to create a revolt as if the country wasn't created on something like that in the first place. As so. a quick aside, as a, a lighter uh, before we move on to the next one, um, what was the name of the FBI agent? The actor who played the uh, his the uh, Jesse Plemons. Jesse Plemons. Jesse Plemons. Uh, me and him were born in the same hospital on the same day in <laughs> Dallas, Texas. Um, we both uh, share a birthday and hospital, so we were probably in the same maternity ward. Just huh, how about that? Just a fun little interesting fact. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. But yeah, what what you're getting with this film are actors who really get are really giving given opportunity to really develop a character yes. and a do well on a historical character. I mean, it, it's no surprise that this is your number one on this just because, just because I know what kind of filmmaking that you really like and really enjoy. And with this one, you get a very, very compelling story of history yes. and you've got, and you've got actors who really had to, do, who really had to look at some very, very tough uh, history Yes, and develop and mature these characters uh you know, on screen, uh, delivering, you know, very, very potent speeches, delivering, you know, some really, really tough dialogue. And of course, you know, having to kind of get into that mind of people who, you know, you know, one man who's trying to save his community and another man who's about to betray it. Yep. I mean, that's, that's compelling story, storytelling in and of itself, but knowing that this is actual history, knowing that, you know, something terrible went down with this man being shot. It's, it's a really, really, deep and rich story that you know two really actors who were coming to their own only could have told it's true it's a big big deal uh, that they could get this one on screen and for it to be as uh critically acclaimed and, uh, as successful uh in delivering that story to you know the world it's a big deal man well, it totally is and the other part of it is too is that this is the what i love about this is the big the big meta narrative that's also here is this is the choice of black people at that time you either were going to stand out and speak against it like fred hampton or you were going to be, be like will o'neill well it's not that bad as long as i get paid and people give me money it's not that bad mm -hmm. and so it really highlights that you probably fell in one or the other box and most people fell in the box of no because martin luther king jr stepped out and spoke against this why shouldn't we Right, so they were continuing what MLK did because this was after MLK when this when Hampton was shot and all this stuff, right? So, so when you start thinking about all of that, you start going, okay, this gives you the picture of listen, if you were black in America, you were either going to be like you know uh, Fred Hampton here, that's how you were feeling, or you were going to be like Stanfield, and, and we have those people today, like Candace Owens, anybody like yeah. Stanfield? <laughs> that, that goes to what I mean, like like Kay, the Kazak pointed out, there's a lot of spinning plates in here that any one element not done well could have brought the entire movie down. So even, I don't, even side characters, I'm like, wow, they, they really bring a performance. And there's a level of tension in this movie. There are some sequences in this film where I was on the edge of my seat. Um, there's a sequence with, again, y'all need to see it, where they confront him in the car. He's getting confronted. They're like, hey, there's something off about you. And I was on the edge of my seat, like, how's this going to turn out? And um, The Black uh, Panthers were confronting Will O'Neill. Uh, Will O'Neill. I apologize. Thank you for getting the names. Yeah, they confront yeah. him, and the, the, that sequence is edge of your seat. I am like, how is this going to turn out? Like, this guy is betraying them. Uh, it's, yeah, nothing but praise for this movie. Yeah, I, I, I cannot believe I forgot about it this late in the game, but I blame 2020. It, it's warped time. <laughs> like, time. Yeah, I thought Jews and Black Messiah came out like 10 years ago, right? <laughs> nope. Great film. Great yeah, film. and you're right. It's going to have a lot of Academy Awards. I think I was looking it up. It's already going to be uh, Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor, Critics' Choice Award for Best Supporting Actor. Why is this all supporting? That's crazy. What about the main actor? Okay, Golden Globes for Best Supporting. Wow. Because a, a lot of times it's Who are they counting for, as supporting? The Lakeith Stanfield. It's, you know what it might it, be? Uh, just because Steinfeld's been really... Or, I'm sorry, Daniel Kaluuya. They got him as the supporting actor. What? So, yeah, that's what this is saying. Well, then this well, is nonsense. Th oh, I'm it, sorry. Because the reason why they do that is because it's easier to get them uh, the Oscar nods if they put them in the supporting if they put them in, if they put them in the supporting role. I don't want to deal too deep into it, but I guess I'd be yeah. curious of who they count as the main actor then. Probably with Keith Stanfield. Stanfield. 
That's a it weird has to take. be him. Yeah, that, that is. That is a weird take. I, I think even the, the Ferris uh, being generous, he he is supporting to. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, hey, it's their award. <laughs> it's their He's award. Uh, He's bad. They're, tr- they're going for they're going for the win on it. That's why they that's yep. why they do it that way. So yeah, no, that makes sense. I yeah. thank you for kind of line. That's like a very good point. And yeah. That's very clearly what they're doing. I can disagree with it, but yeah, uh, yeah no, it makes doing. sense. Yeah. Well, let's get to our last topic du jour, last topic of the day, and this is where we're gonna tell you out of all the bad films of 2021, and maybe perhaps series if you want to go there, but I think movies probably will handle it. Which were the worst films in 2021. So when we say worst films, make no mistake, this is nowhere near the best films. These are the dumpster fires. These are the films that you're going to ask the question, who on earth approved this? And what was that pitch like in the pitch meeting that allowed them to get this movie made? And so, Mike, the worst film of 2021 or series was? For me, the 2021 remake of Cowboy Bebop. Uh, based on a 90s anime, um, you know, Japanese animation, uh, which is in held in high regard and is usually in the conversation as the number one or number two greatest animes of all time. Mm-hmm. And, and while I am not the, I do like the series quite a bit, I am not one of those people that puts it in the number one slot, but I'm like, no, it's in the conversation. Like, it is that good. So everyone was like, I don't know where you're going to adapt this to live action. And man, do they face plant, man. I got, this is a, I think, 10 episode series remake. And I got five episodes and I just rage quit. I'm like, I live by the saying, <laughs> life is too short for mediocrity. Mm-hmm. And I do not tolerate bad products anymore. I just cut it right mm. off and move on to something else. Yeah. This thing has, it is tragic in the sense of, it's. I do feel there might be passion in this project. But you know what I think this this film has? It's passion without talent or technical skill because i feel like they tried to do things with this show that they didn't do well and i think the actors john chose in it like it's got some good actors in it but i just oh boy it, it just n- none of it worked well um and they do a thing do yourselves a favor uh of uh fulfillment uh fans look up weed and speak it's this way of sing song talking where you pause, let the audience, you make references, mm-hmm. you pause to let them laugh at the reference. This show is rampant with that level of talk. And it got so on my nerves, I just cut off half no, of the series. I can't do um, it. And uh, one of the actors, the actor playing the main villain, is probably one of the worst actors I've ever seen in my life. I'm not even like a big thespian guy, but I know when acting is great and I know when acting is bad. Usually I don't know it's acting because I just assume. You know, I'm in with the character, but that actor was bad for the main villain. It, it was truly awful, and I, uh, it really does make me sad because I like I think you guys clearly like it, but I don't think you were skilled enough to bring to screen what you like about this show of Cowboy Bebop. So it's a dodge, man. Just watch the original series. That thing's a masterpiece. This is a sad, sad disgrace to it. Mm. Wow. Okay, Zach. Let's see. Oh, dumpster fire 2021 for so you. So for me, uh, <laughs> this is a case of folks, be careful what you wish for because you may get it. And that was Zack Snyder's Justice League. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really, really need black and white drawn out slow motion sequences with screaming Celtic music over and over again. The hammer the point out that Uh. this is dark, moody DC. No, you didn't need any of it. You didn't need all of it. You just got more Zack Snyder than you ever really wanted. You could have gotten this in two hours. It's mm-hmm. fine. The mm-hmm. editing is okay. It is good to edit. It, it, it is good to trim things down. Yep. But making them black and white and longer and more boring and stretching it out to six to eight parts to make it feel like you're just locked in a time loop of mm. just nothing but this will never end. <laughs> I just I, it, it it was just so unnecessary for the hardcore fans. Okay, if you like Zack Snyder, good for you. Please seek help. But um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just just, just yeah, yeah, I I again, you were talking about you know how art is important, things like yeah. that. Okay, yeah, yes, that that's true. But also, yeah. when it comes to films, 
editing is important. For yes. sure. The, the, there's an the, art to editing. The, 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 yeah, there, there, yeah there, there's nothing wrong. There, There's always something wrong, you know, when, when corporate gets their notes, but by the same token, mm -hmm. sometimes you need that feedback. You need that pushback. You need that person to say no. And when you finally say, okay, here's what happens when no doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> and you get... 18 hours of Justice League, uh, and I just don't need that much slow motion Aquaman. I just don't. That's I just what, don't. Yeah. I just Ooh. don't. Now, while, I will say, while it was a little bit, uh, it, get, it only got an honorable mention for me, because I do think you're right. It, it's a director's cut, so they are very much, this is everything he wanted to put in the movie. I think the only reason it was in the conversation for me this year was I was more impressed by the behind the scenes story of him kind of going that extra mile, like watching somebody climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I was like, oh, you did that thing you said you were going to do. Proud of you, Zack Snyder. But uh, it is bloated. It's four hours. Like, that, that, come on now. Like, <laughs> come on now. Fair enough. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, I still won't see it for that very reason because I've, I've heard that. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I've heard the arguments from the people who loved it and that long, which we know him. We, we, we know several people like that of the film Samurai loved it because he loves Zack Snyder. Yes. But even when the great Sick film Samurai talks about it, it doesn't compel me. Even when he tries to tell me what was great about it, I have to say, yeah, but you're biased because you're a Zack right. Snyder fan. And therefore, you can't probably see mm -hmm. the stuff that we would see that who aren't yes. under the spell of Zack Snyder. And which, that's why even, like I said, it would have been in my honorable mentions mainly because of I'm rooting for Snyder. I'm not even a big fan of him. But I just The story behind this movie was kind of made me root for him, but... To, to there's so many if this movie had come out without the story behind it like this was the one that came out in what 2018 I think it was when it originally came out I think so um no I would have I would have loathed this watching this like in theaters like this would not have been it but I think that's what puts it in the conversation but you're I think you're spot on like this is not a movie for everyone this is this is a movie designed 100% for Zack fans or DC Universe fans like no I can, I can see where you're coming from Zack Molly disagree, but I do. I, I do completely agree, <laughs> and and that's why we're and that's why we we that's why we have discourse. That's why we have this format to that's basically. 100%. Oh yeah, to to, to, yes, have, sir. to mildly agree yeah. to disagree. Me why Twitter cancel you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Twitter cancel you. I'm unfriended I'm now. Unfriended. <laughs> I'm canceled by the Zack Snyder universe. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> well, almost as bad, maybe as bad. I can't know because I didn't watch six hours of that mess. I can tell you about another one that I think was, in so in so many words, I would just say, why? Why do we need this movie? And then Disney will say, because it's a property that makes a lot of money. So when we bought Fox, that's why we're going to do Home Sweet Home Alone. Yeah. That's right. So now we're going to go in and take another great film that people loved on, on whole. And, you know, as a universal, people love the Christmas story of, you know, Macaulay Culkin back in the day doing Home Alone. That was cool. Well, this is the sixth Home Alone film that we've got. And now this is the Disney-owned one. And so they attempt here to try to switch it. And there's certain things you don't switch. Again, they need to watch the sequels to learn this. You don't switch Luke Skywalker's character. It'll never go well. On this one, you can't switch this and make the people who are coming to rob the house be the people that you're feeling sorry for. Yep. Because they're breaking into a house. And even if they think it's a good idea because they need some money because of whatever and blah, 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 blah. You, I get it. You want to try to do your own spin to it, but you can't make Luke Skywalker be the pissy old man. He, he's the most hopeful person in the galaxy. Here, mm -hmm. you, you can't make us start to feel bad for the bad guys breaking in the house because, well, they're still breaking in. And, and secondly, if we feel sorry for them, then that just makes your little kid a jerk. Because he's the one setting up all the props that's getting them hurt and killed. So why so would you want to make them... They, they just remade Don't Breathe? To a degree, except for they can oh, see. Oh, no. When, when you see this. No. You know what? Look, I want to let PA pick because yeah, I, yeah, I watched yeah. it also. And yeah. I'm an actual fan of this franchise. I know. And this was abysmal. Yeah. Uh, but uh, please continue. In every way. So when you make the character. So first of all, you tweak a plot, which will give you some points for trying to do something a little different. But the angle that you went and the direction that you went makes the characters unlikable. Almost all of them, except for the he, the villains who are breaking in, right, doing something wrong. So, to me, I looked at this and I thought, there's, there's, they, here's the, here's how you know it's the worst movie in the world when they sit there and go, in the movie they say, man, why do they keep remaking old stuff when the, none of them can be as good as the original? That line was in the movie, and I was just like, 
that should have been it. You should have cut, cut, stop making, stop directing right there. As soon as you said that line, that should have been in the movie because you're doing the very thing but trying to use it as a joke. So yep. just using it as a joke doesn't mean that the movie's funny or clever. No, you said the thing that everybody else is saying, and we're all kind of going, yeah, thumbs down, stop with this mess right here, right now. So the kid is annoying he's not likable at all and some might say well kevin was a little yeah but kevin was precocious he was just a boy right just wanting to explain with things and see things explode so i i, I could see that but this kid is just unlikable you see, he's, he's a smart ass he's just all these things and then of course what doesn't work as well is technology but they try to work around the technology of how someone could leave a kid again behind with in this world of cell phones and video cameras at the door with the ring and all this stuff that's even worse. And then with that, they tried to go around it. But even their answers for trying to tell you why, oh, well, this is why he wasn't able to use a cell phone. This is why he wasn't able to use this camera. This is why you're kind of going, oh, wow, you made a movie just so you could make excuses about technology. <laughs> I, wa I watched. Uh, so yeah. Oh, no, I watched in Rip real time. <laughs> dude, I watched in real time. Mm -hmm. I said I watched that nonsense. In this one, people warn me, too, by the way. Mm -hmm. I, everyone warned me, but this is how they get you. Cause I'm a fan of that franchise. I've seen well, all the other ones, and I'm just like, well, I gotta, I gotta finish it. Like, I gotta, I gotta be there for it, even though it. it plus, I'm not paying any extra for it. I'm technically already paid for it. <laughs> so, I watched it, and you are one minute. Talk about missing the absolute core of your franchise. I should not feel bad about the bad guys. Every other one of these movies, they're trying to hurt a kid or murder a kid. So mm -hmm. you feel happy when they get their comeuppance. Mm -hmm. These are. I, I don't think there's a single person in existence who would not feel empathy mm -hmm. for the bur the burglars are trying to get back what they think is their property. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, it's stupid because real people would be like, "Hey, wait a minute!" They would explain after the first trap. They'd be like, "Whoa, whoa! There's a misunderstanding. We just want to get our yeah. our thing back." Mm -hmm. But they just keep every plot contrivance like yep. just and then. For me, my number one thing I love about Home Alone is the gadgets and the traps. Yeah, these are like the lamest traps I've like ever seen. I'm like, uh, these are lame, dude. Like, I don't need like Rue Goldberg machine, twenty things flipping over a switch and all that stuff. But these were, oh dear, yeah, this was so, this was rough. I just yeah. so again because I'm never going to see this. I never this, yeah, ever, sure. ever I would have seen see it if the ticket wasn't paid for by the friend who took me. And I saw the <laughs> you. You have the technology of Inspector Gadget. The plot of Don't Breathe and the excuses of the Child's Play remake. At what point is any of this wanting to make me see anything of this no, film? I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, they banked, I'm uh, done. They banked on nostalgia for the license mm -hmm. and the fact that they got a cast member from the original movie. But even the previous Home Alone movie actually has a, I think French Stewart plays him. Uh, they bring back a character. And that was even more reasonable than this. I, I genuinely felt bad for the bad guys. And I think even toddlers, like even young, young kids understand right and wrong. And they would even understand like, it's wrong for people who are trying to do good in context of the story mm -hmm. to be hurt. Th that is, it, it, it's just not good. And I was basically in real time watching a franchise I really kind of grew up with and liked. Just basically, it dragged out back and shot. Like I, I think that's it. I, I think it's done. Um, yeah. Disney may bring it around so they can keep the the property going. So probably probably licensing or something. Mm -hmm. I, this movie feels like feels very corporate. I yeah. Like we were saying before, I don't think there's a, there's not a single love for the franchise of this. It felt so corporate and by the numbers, it, it was miserable to watch. Um, if it, it because it was only like an hour and a half, I powered through the whole thing. Unlike you know a ten hour show, but. D dear that that's yeah. this is this is what i don't need to see more of and sadly i feel like this is it feels like movies are going more in this direction than i'm seeing the good there's two roads cinema all right there's yeah. Billy home and there's spider-man yeah that's starting down a whole other road and i think we're gonna have to stop it here today because we are my way apologies. over time you are that's correct. fine you are 100 correct let's do yeah. a shout outs and get out of here man <laughs> all right my apologies let's get out of here yeah all right so mike who are you shouting out to um, shout out to my mom and dad as always. Uh, hey, Seuss and Keith of Keith's Comics. Uh, just to everyone out there, guys, just take care of yourself and take care of your family. Shout out to y'all's families. Like, tell them uh, you love them. It's been a rough yeah. year and 
We all got to hang on. Then there's a new year coming up. We won't be here next week, but new, next week the calendar changes. So yeah, you, this is your shout outs and happy new years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, Zach, who are you shouting out to? Uh, I do want to shout out our Dallas on air family. Of course, uh, do uh, check out everything here on DallasOnAir.com, including our friends, uh, uh, Eddie Medina and Colleen Medina on uh, figments and, uh, 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 fan and wife also check out uh, me and Cole Houston on the Rancor Pit and Isle of Toys. Uh, we're uh, we're on opposite Sundays. At, uh, for those who you, if you turn into Flint on the second fourth Sundays, check out uh, Dallas on Air first and third Sundays. Also, I do want to go ahead and shout out our wonderful friends Jansen and Cat for bringing forth a, a wonderful, very spidey Christmas. Uh, uh, to the Dallas Fort Worth area, got a lot of kids, a lot of toys. Uh, we do still want you guys to keep on doing that. Uh, please go to VerySpendyChristmas.com. You can see how to donate next year. Because, like I said, we do want to keep this going. We do want to keep, like I said, bringing toys. And, like I said, we don't just want to do this at Christmas. We want to do this all year round. So, please, if you can, give the Heroes United uh, and help some kids. You know, enjoy themselves uh, in the in the company of superheroes. Uh, Jansen and Cat do a really really fun thing for uh, the Dallas Fort Worth. Metroplex, and uh, this is your opportunity to get involved with them. So please uh, give, show your love, and again, congratulations to Jansen Cat for delivering Christmas to some very, very needy kids here in Dallas Fort Worth. Kudos, guys. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, kudos for sure. And certainly, I want to shout out to Brandy and Barry Austin, Sean Presley, Lauren Weedauer, Tristan Frazier, uh, Harry Thomas, Prim, uh, Troy Ross, Daniel Meza, Freddie. And he knows which Freddie I'm talking about. Eddie Medina, of course, Cole Houston, and Good Buds, of, of course, uh, then Steffi Crane, uh, and the film Samurai. I would be remiss if I didn't say that. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the last show of 2021. We will see you again January 9th and January 23rd. So it'll be a new year. And in the new year, we're going to talk about what we're excited about for movies that are coming up in 2022. So we hope to see you then. And until then, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you. All right.